Today, of course, we're going to be talking about another one of those difficult topics, which is cruelty, and this time to animals. This is one of my favorite paintings. Jean Honé Fragonard um, painted this. It's called Dog Making Girl. Ah, that was a nice slip. Girl making a dog dance on her bed. And it's painted in the late 1760s. Now, the painting is actually typical of his really quite decadent style. You can see its warm tones, its luxurious um, brushwork, energetic celebration, if you like, of pleasure. In the painting, a young girl lies back on her bed holding a small spaniel whose tail moves between her legs, caressing her vulva and buttocks. Its phallic energy is palpable. The girl's bedside table, it's not a very good reproduction here, but her bedside table is open, a visual allegory to her receptivity to sensual advances. The cool blue ribbon of the girl's nightcap is echoed in the bow of the spaniel's. Spanel. The two beautiful creatures, in other words, are in harmony. Girl making a dog dance on her bed is basically a scene of reciprocal adoration and erotic enjoyment. Now, I've chosen this painting this evening um, because it's a scene of mutuality between a girl and a dog. And to be frank, most of my talk this evening is going to be about disharmony, or worse, outright cruelty. As a species, humans are singularly bad at loving animals. We admire exotic wildlife while destroying their habitats. We um, are distressed by the unkind treatment of animals, but regulate slaughter within abattoirs. Western lifestyles are wholly dependent upon farming animals, um, which involve practices of extraordinary cruelty. Philosopher Jacques Derrida invented a term to describe this sort of human-animal interactions or relationship. He called it carno fellogocentrism. In other words, our treatment, it's a long word for something very simple, actually. Our treatment of animals is based on privileging masculine traits, the fallow, the possession of language, the logos, and involves a willingness to kill and eat other sentient beings, the carno. But here, I think, is the contradiction. People are cruel to non-human animals, yet we loudly proclaim to truly love them. We call some of them our pets. In uh, last year, 68% uh, of American homes contain a pet. That's um, nearly 85 million homes. UK, the pet population is around 51 million. 45% of us own, own a pet. Children, in other words, are much more likely to live with a pet than to live with a father. The most common companion species are dogs, followed by cats, although pet owners generally are reluctant to allow their animals to act according to their nature, and many, in fact, even euthanize them when they become old, unattractive, or indeed simply disobedient. Um, there's general agreement that loving our pets means giving them food and water, ensuring that they get exercise, and talking to them. Half of all pets in the US sleep in the same bed as their owner. We maintain fictive kin relationships with them. We indulge them, buy them presents, give them names, look upon them as almost human. We kiss and caress them. We dance with them on our beds. Now in this talk, I'm gonna range quite widely over debates about cruelty to non-human animals. Although, as we'll see shortly, concern about the lives of animals can be traced right the way back to the beginning of human time, I'm gonna be largely focusing on my area of expertise, which is the uh, period from the 19th century to the present, when organized groups of people set out to legally, as well as socially, enforce certain forms of behavior in dealing with animals. Often, this behavior 
was accompanied by threats against offenders of the so-called kindness codes. It should come as no surprise, at least to the historians in this room, that the strong evangelical focus of 19th century animal lovers resulted in a rather overblown rhetoric, insisting, in fact, that a special, a certain kind of hell was reserved for people who were cruel to animals. This can not only be seen in sermons addressed to the faithful, but also indeed, and I think really interestingly, to young children. Um, in other words, in some of the very earliest books specifically marketed to children and our children readers. One example here of the hundreds I've got is called a book entitled Kindness to Animals, 1845, written by Charlotte Elizabeth Turner, a prolific and very, very, very popular evangelical um, novelist. In this book, she described the horrible death of a young boy who worked as a butcher's assistant. On his deathbed, this child, this boy, was tormented by the memory of being cruel to God's dumb creatures. Dumb meaning not being able to speak, dumb creatures. The boy, she writes, remember this is marketed for children around the age of five to 10. The boy died shrieking out that he must go to hell. Tona reminded her young readers that the agonies of one hour hereafter would be worse than all the tortures that could be inflicted on God's creatures during their whole lives. But instead of an hour, it is forever and ever that all who go to that dreadful place of punishment must remain. It is impossible for a cruel man to be happy. It is entirely, and these are her caps, it is entirely impossible. He shall have judgment without mercy who hath shown no mercy. An 18, this by the way is not an unusual example of the genre. An 1898 sermon entitled on behalf of dumb animals concurred. A terrible retribution will overtake those who inflicted pain on the defenseless dumb creation argued the rector, adding, call it hell or whatever you like. I believe that they will, in the life to come, undergo severe chastisement, for it is only by enduring pain themselves that they will ever be brought to realize the depth of their own brutality, in other words, their own brutality to animals. This, divine, this emphasis on divine retribution continued, in fact, very much until very late in the century and indeed early um, 20th century. But increasingly what we see is we get a change in the language used and the nemesis increasingly took on a more human form. Just to give one um, of uh, many examples, 1888 the Humane Society published a poem as part of their aims and objectives. The poem was prefaced with the assertion that divine truth decreed that with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. After this bow to theology, however, the society identified the actual punisher as God's human agent. agent. The poem introduced readers to a young boy called Tom, who had a habit of plucking off flies, legs, and wings. The Tom's father decided to give him a lesson. Tom's father, catching his son of a sudden and giving his, Tom's, elbow a twist, he pulled his ears till he hallowed, then doubled him up with his fist. And didn't he twist on the carpet and didn't he cry out with pain? But whenever he cried, oh, you hurt me, his father would punch him again uh, for taking off the wings of uh, flies. The message was clear, retributive, retributive violence, whether inflicted, of course, by God the Father or by his paternal representative here on earth, was justified. 
Now, it was an argument, I mean, I've been focusing on the children's literature, but it was, of course, an argument that's applied to adults as well, particularly those working in the so-called vivisection or animal testing industry. Again, just to give one example, um, in this image called A Vesector's Nightmare, published in The Animal's Guardian, 1911. The image accompanies a graphic lists, list of some recent British experiments, and the original caption reads, and you probably can't see it there, but it reads, Cat, you remember, two years ago, you divided the spinal cord of a cat to produce convulsions. Vivisector, too true, alas, I did. Cat, I am that cat. A great number of historians have written really quite eloquently on this anti-vivisectionist movement of the late 19th and early 20th century movement, so I'm not actually going to address those arguments. I mean, so many really brilliant historians have already done that. I think my point here is a much narrower one. That is, to draw attention to a consistent line of argument from the 19th century to more recent times concerning the theological and secular punishment that people would reap for mistreating animals. Support for this uh, violence subsided from the 1940s only to see this major revival, particularly from the 1980s, with the rise, of course, of animal liberationist movements. The newsletter, Archangel for Animal Liberation, led the debates, at least in Britain. In the spring of 1990, Neil from Shrewsbury strenuously defended violence against humans in the interests of non-human animals. It was hard to see, he insisted, how even an equal amount of violence used against an animal abuser could be unacceptable. He extolled his readers to imagine being present when an elderly person was being attacked on the street. What was the correct action? Turning a blind eye? Adopting stance of passivity or you know, pacific uh, reasoning? Or physically retaliating against the attacker? Neil from Shrewsbury believed the third option was indeed the only ethical option. This was the cartoon that accompanied his article showing a chicken killing Colonel Harold um, Sanders, um, of the founder, of course, of Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's worth asking, however, if we look historically, well, you know, in terms of these debates, what actually is wrong about being cruel to animals? This question has, of course, engendered many responses which have changed dramatically over time. One of the earliest extended texts on cruelty to animals is Thomas Young's Essay on Humanity to Animals, 1798. Now, Young argued against cruelty to animals on three grounds, which is, are going to come up time and again in this talk. Theological grounds, pain, and in other words, a sentient argument, and the argument that people who harm animals will harm humans. And these, have been, these three arguments have been echoed throughout the centuries. The first theological argument maintains that animals have only this life. So it is worse to be cruel to them than to humans, who at least would be rewarded for their fortitude in the next life. This was the point made in 1776 by the theologian Humphrey, Humphrey Primate in a, um, a book called A Dissertation on the Duty of Mercy and Sin of Cruelty to Brute Animals. He pointed out that the cruelty of men to brutes is more heinous in point of justice than the cruelty of men unto men. The main reason he gave for the startling con statement concerned access to language. The primate explained that the oppression, uh, sorry, the oppressed man has a tongue that can plead his cause and a finger to point out the, the aggressors. All men that hear of it therefore shudder with horror. <laughs> 
and by applying the case to themselves, pronounce it cruelty with the voice, with the common voice of humanity and unanimously join in demanding the punishment of the offender and brand him with infamy. In contrast, he went on, the dumb beast was afflicted with a literal dumbness. She was speechless. Animals could neither utter complaints nor avenge the wrongs done to them. Cruelty to animals, he continued, caused impossible injury because unlike people who could hope for salvation and eternal happiness in the next life, for animals there could be no hope of internal justice because his present life is the whole of his existence. Now the second religious argument, however, was in fact exactly the opposite of that one. And by the way, these two theological arguments often went really hand in hand. The same people would switch from one to the other quite regularly. Um, but it's very different in contrast to the view that animals only had this life and therefore had to be treated with consideration. Others argued that animal suffering in this world was evidence that they would join good Christians in the heavenly plane. Take um, a letter published again in the Animal Guardian, this time 1915. The author stated that she could not accept that anyone believing in divine love could possibly think there is no compensation, meaning in the afterlife. Uh, she couldn't believe that anyone believing in divine love could possibly think there is no compensation for the weary old cab horse standing so meekly in the rain and bitter cold, the little unwanted stray looking up into the faces of passers-by, dumbly asking for a little love and pity, the encaged lark, the quivering wingless fly, the victim of the cruelty of some thoughtless child, like the one we just heard about, or any of the suffering animal life of the universe. Another proponent of animal welfare put it in less florid terms. The suffering animals in this life was as needful for them for their perfection as it is for man. Now, these theological defenses of um, animals were deeply intertwined with anti-slavery movements. From the very birth of the language of rights in a century, indeed, before Darwin published The Descent of Man, the enslavement of people was associated with the concerns about the status of animals. William Wilberforce, leader of the anti-slavery movement, was also active in legislation against animal cruelty, introducing in 1800 the first parliamentary bill in the UK against bull baiting. Now, the most famous, though, of the images that's kind of seared on the you know, historical conscience and, and at the time came in the 1860s with Monkeyania, which was published in Punch in 1861. It implied that the kinship between slaves and monkeys was close enough to be actually worthy of satire. At the time Punch actually um, uh, published or printed this cartoon, it was actively supporting the emancipation of slaves in the American Civil War. Would the movement to free human slaves eventually um, spread to humans' other relatives, the cartoonist was suggesting? Now, central to these comparisons between oppressed humans and oppressed animals was the idea of suffering itself. Primate argued that a brute is an animal no less sensible of pain than a man, since they possess similar nerves and organs of sensation. Although a suffering animal cannot utter his complaints by speech or human voice, his cries and groans are as strong indications to us of his sensibility to pain as the cries and groans of a human being whose language we don't understand. Most famously, however, um, people here will know, most famously of the utilitarian philosopher Jeremy Bentham applied arguments about sentience and sympathy to animals 
um, arguments about sentience and sympathy to animals. In a footnote in his very famous an introduction to the principles of morals and legislation, 1789, he correctly observed that a adult dog and horse um, were was as more rational, a more rational as well as more conversable animal than an infant of one day or one week or even a month old. Important ethical considerations then was not whether a, a creature could talk or reason, which have often been regarded as the criddle faculties distinguishing humans from other animals, but can they suffer? Evidence of, human, of animal suffering was the stock and trade of anti-animal cruelty campaigns of the 19th century. It even appeared in the first Bovril, the meat extract advert, in the late 1890s with its shocking title, Alas, My Poor Brother, and showing a bull crying. And by the way, the tears are absolutely crucial absolutely crucial for this because tears were widely regarded as something that distinguished humans from non-human animals. In the words of one physician given evidence before Senate hearing on vivisection, 1900, without sensibility there is no right. A being without sensibility can suffer no wrong. The endowment of sensibility is the endowment of rights. Now, it is also, I think, worth asking why the fact that animals feel pain should, in fact, be any reason to treat them kindly. In part, I think, for the people at the time, this was because of this new sensibility that was developing, um, which abhorred inflicting pain. People were increasingly becoming aware that other sentient beings lived autonomous inner lives. Violence was shunned starting with violence against humans, but quickly embracing non-human animals. Respect for the bodily integrity of other sentient beings, both forged and advanced a sentimental sympathy for their lot. In the book entitled Characteristics of Men, Manners, Opinions, Times, written, uh, published 1711, the third Earl of Shaftesbury developed a theory of ethics that emerged not from religion, but from natural affection. Imagination, he believed, was the home of a divine presence in each person. Right and wrong, Shaftesbury um, argued, could be understood through the application of the imaginative powers of sympathy allowing one person to experience another person's pain. Now, Shaftesbury's ethics was radical, especially for the time. It posited a new image of humanity as sympathetic and innately moral. Moral philosopher Adam Smith um, developed the idea in his The Theory of Moral Sentiments, 1759. Man may seem selfish, Smith admitted in the book's first sentence, but there are some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortunes of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. Through acts of imagination, other people's agonies are made manifest. And he wrote, and we then tremble and shudder at the thought of what he feels. This belief in a moral instinct called compassion or sympathy, empathy, the word comes much, much later, that enabled people to see other sentient beings as creatures like themselves, opened up, if you like, the space for the talk of rights. But it was also linked to widespread views that the most important reason animals needed to be treated kindly was to safeguard humans. It was taken for granted by practically everyone, a few exceptions, whether animal lover or not, um, that allowing cruelty to animals would open the way for cruelty towards humans. German philosopher Kant famously argued in the Metaphysics of Morals, 17, 
1797, that behaving kindly towards animals was, in his words, own, always only a duty of man to himself. As he elaborated, with regard to the animate but non-rational part of creation, violent and cruel treatment of animals is far more intimately opposed to man's duty to himself, and he has a duty to refrain from this, for it dulls his shared feeling of their pain, and so weakens and gradually uproots a natural predisposition that is very serviceable to morality in one's relations to other men. Now, it's important that this was certainly not an argument for treating humans equally, for treating animals equally uh, with people. Um, for example, Soam uh, Jennings' uh, book, Disquisitions on Several Subjects, 1782, made an argument about the wonderful chain of being uh, to differentiate between the shellfish through to insects, fishes, birds, beasts, then to dogs and apes, and after the latter came the primitive. And then we reach, in Bacon, in a Bacon or a Newton, it attains the summit. Since, he continued, the happiness of creatures beneath humans was dependent upon our wills, it was reasonable to conclude that our lives and happiness are equally dependent on the wills of those above us. After death, people would have to justify their treatment of animals in front of their common father. For Jennings, there was no contradiction between arguing that animals needed to be treated compassionately if people were able to hold their heads high before the throne of judgment to killing them for dinner. Indeed, one of the chief reasons why animals had to be killed with tenderness and compassion was because providence had created them in such a way that animals who experienced a painful and lingering death would taste rancid and unpalatable. Jennings bluntly argued that this was God's way of compelling us to be merciful and cautious of animals suffering for the sake of ourselves. Legislation against animal cruelty, which in Britain began to be passed from 1800 onwards, was not, in fact, much about animals at all, but about the way that many abuses of animals took place in disorderly contexts. In other words, bull and bear baiting being infamous examples. In other words, cruelty to animals encouraged disorderly conduct in general that was unworthy of a sort of civilized decorum. In other words, protesters against animal cruelty were concerned primarily with the need to control and reform the lower class of people, of humans. This explains why the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals had no problem admitting members who were enthusiastic fox hunters a sport for the decorous affluential um, classes, affluent classes. Opposition to cruelty to animals was less about the animals themselves and more concerned with kind of encouraging this kind of middle class, this new middle class sensibility. Now, there was a very different tradition, however, emerging from the end of the 19th century. This one was not about um, theology, it was not about middle class sensibilities. It was arguably not even about fears that cruelty to animals would lead to cruelty to humans. Rather, from the 1880s onwards, cruelty to animals was pathologized. It was a form of mental degeneration. The most influential commentator here is um, Austro German forensic psychiatrist Richard von Klapdebing whose Psychopathia Sexualis was first published in 1886. Now, this book is incredibly important. Between its first publication and Krafft-Ebing's death in 1904, it was went through 12 editions, including some quite um, popular, cheap editions. 
Crap Debbing led arguments that people who were cruel to animals were actually degenerates. So he, he's medicalizing these whole debates. They're degenerates. He was particularly concerned with the pathology of people who were sexually cruel to animals. According to him, such men possessed a heavy taint and constitutional neurosis. In other words, men who mutilated animals' genitals or engaged in sex acts with animals were atavistic throwbacks to an earlier evolutionary um, stage of life. A typical bestialist, according to Kraft Ebbing, was a patient whose unmarried mother was deeply tainted and hysterioepileptic. The patients, he went on, the patients deformed asymmetrical cranium and deformity and asymmetry of the bones of the face were proof of psychical degeneracy. And he had been a masturbator as well as an abuser of animals since early youth. In short, people who were cruel to animals were, as he put it, human monsters. The very language that these early forensic psychiatrists use is really very, very indicative. And his, his work is taken up by dozens of others um, in, the, in this period. They spoke of monsters, human beasts, lower orders, animalistic men, human gorillas. In other words, they adhered strongly to a great, this great chain of being according to which everything in the entire universe was ranked from the highest to the lowest. One aspect of this chain of being involved perceptions of sensation. But differently, there was a parallel, parallel to the great chain of being, there was this great chain of feeling, which placed male Europeans at one end and slaves and animals at the other end. Certainly, Advocates of, advocates of slavery and believers in the superiority of the European races adhered to this great chain of feeling idea. According to the author of an 1876 track on vivisection, what would be torture to one creature is barely felt by another. Even amongst the lower types of man, feeling is less acute and blows and cuts are treated with indifference by the Aboriginal Australian, which would lay a European in hospital. The bestialists that Kraft Ebbings was writing about were, of course, at the lowest, lower end of this chain of, of being and feeling. They were insensitive to pain, thus ranking as low as the animals they were indeed abusing. This idea that sentience is tied to rights pervaded 19th century and early 20th century literatures. More philosophers like uh, Joseph Rickaby, who was also, by the way, a Jesuit priest, were uncompromising. As he put it in Moral Philosophy or Ethics and Natural Law, 1888, brute beasts, not having understanding and therefore not being persons, cannot have any rights. They are of a number of things. There was, he went on, no shadow of evil resting on the practice of causing pain to brutes and sport, where the pain is not the sport itself, but incidental to it. Equally, for him, pain could not be caused to animal, could be caused to animals, sorry, pain could be inflicted on animals in the pursuit of science. Signs of struggle under painful stimuli was nothing more than simply reflexes. This supposed insensibility to painful stimuli was, however, being attacked on all sides. Um, from animal guardians to certain scientists. This was linked in the last quarter of the 20th century to the rise and rise of rights, human rights. Right speech had become incredibly popular in deliberations by and about oppressed human groups. So why might it not be applied to animals? <laughs> 
In other words, because women, slaves and animals have feelings, they have interests, including an interest in not being harmed, tortured, killed. They should be treated in certain ways. In the 1970s, this approach was um, promulgated by philosopher Peter Singer. As he put it in Rethinking Life and Death, 1994, whether or not dogs and pigs are persons, they can certainly feel pain and suffer in a variety of ways. And our concern for their suffering should not depend on how rational and self-aware they might be. This philosophical approach called preferential utilitarianism, um, according to this ethical behavior, must arise from a consideration of the greatest satisfaction of desires or preferences. The morally correct action is the action that produces the most favorable consequences for those involved. Different rights philosophy um, is advocated by Tom Regan there. He claims, and this is a different version, these are two main versions, these two uh, philosophers. He claims that as possessors of intrinsic value, all moral agents, which includes some animals, and all moral patients, he means here people who are severely mentally handicapped, for example, possessed, but possess basic rights. He asks, might moral behavior be based on conferring certain rights on sentient beings? For Reagan, all moral agents and patients possess rights, and these rights are universal. In other words, they exist independently of one's voluntary acts and independent of the position they happen to occupy in any given institutional arrangement. The basic right of all was the right to respectful treatment. According to him, Peter Singer's emphasis on pleasure or preference satisf satisfaction was irrelevant because all beings are possessed of inherent value, not merely receptacles of intrinsic values. Reagan argues that people have a duty not to harm by killing animals and those human moral patients like those animals in the relevant respects. Now, in a society in which rights have become the dominant ideology both on the political right and on the political left, equating human and animal rights was an inspired uh, one. This proposition was eagerly taken up by the Great Ape Project of the um, early 1990s. According to this project, chimpanzees, orangutans, gorillas should be welcomed into the community of equals. These animals are entitled to certain basic rights, including entitlement to life, the protection of their individual liberty, and the right not to be tortured. Human guardians would be assigned to safeguard the interests and rights of these animals. In the words of the framers of the, great De of the Declaration on Great Apes, 1993, we have not forgotten that we live in a world in which for at least three quarters of the human population, the idea of human rights is no more than rhetoric and not a reality in everyday life. Nevertheless, they went on. The denial of the basic rights of particular other species will not assist the world's poor and oppressed to win their just struggles. Nor is it reasonable to ask that the members of these other species should wait until all humans should have achieved their rights first. That suggestion itself assumes that beings belonging to other species are of less moral significance than human beings. Now, the implication that poor and oppressed humans might be of less moral significance than chimpanzees, orangutans, and gorillas, of course, exacerbated, exasperated, <laughs> exasperated many subjugated peoples throughout the world when they read this. It's important to note um, that these animal proponents we're not, of course, arguing that animal rights should be identical to human rights. It's nonsense to provide them with the right to marry, become a member of parliament, for example. 
In addition, assigning personhood on any creature involves making decisions about thresholds. Um, spiders are not apes. Rather, proponents of animal rights insist that animals should be given rights in harmony with their interests and dignity. There have been many critics of the rights position. Donna Haraway, for example, observes that the last thing animals need is human subject status. The best animals could get out of that approach is the right to be permanently represented as lesser humans in human discourses such as the law. Animals would get the right to be permanently or orientalized. Legal philosopher Costas Duzinas is also skeptical on slightly different grounds. In The End of Human Rights, 2000, he forcefully argues that rights are what creates the person, they are not what belong to, the pers to persons. The chief problem with conferring rights, then, is a fundamental one for post-humanists. It merely shores up a specific notion of the human. This is exactly the point that Jacques Derrida was making in his critique of the Great Apes Project. He argued that it is a fault or a weakness to extend to animals a certain con concept of the, juridical, of the juridical, that of human rights. The proponents of, animal, of the Great, Ana Great Ape Project seek to reaffirm the particular concept of the human subject of post-Cartesian human subjectivity, which is at the foundation of the concept of human rights. Such a position, he maintained, was naive. He went on to clarify his position by pointing out that to confer or to recognize rights for animals is a surreptitious or implicit way of confirming a certain interpretation of the human subject, which itself will have been the very lever, lever of the worst violence carried out against non-human living beings. Consequently, to want absolutely to grant, not to animals, but to a certain category of animals, rights equivalent to human rights would be a disastrous contradiction. It would reproduce the philosophical and juridical machine, thanks to which the exploitation of animal material for food, work, experimentation, etc., has been practiced, and tyrannically so, that is, through an abuse of power. Granting rights to a certain category of animals would simply, in other words, reinforce the animal-human distinction. It would solidify a particular concept of what it means to be human. In fact, it simply reifies the distinction between animals and humans. Furthermore, since the project can Im ex implicitly exclude certain humans from rights, the neurologically impaired, for instance, it, in Derrida's words, amounts to reintroduction in effect, um, sorry, amounts to reinduce, reintroducing in effect a properly racial and geneticist hierarchy. This is a strong reason to be wary of animal rights. In other words, it is a modern humanist politics for a world that has already gone post-human. In more recent years, though, the rights philosophy has also come into criticism from feminists. In part, this was a response of the, unfortunately, of the tendency of some leading spokesmen in the animal rights movements to repudiate womanish emotionality in their critiques of the treatment of animals. Notoriously, Peter Singer complained that animal rights had traditionally been associated with womanish, trivial sentiment. He complained that the portrayal of those who protest against cruelty to animals as sentimental, emotional animal lovers has diverted discussions from serious, political, and moral discussion. In the case for animal rights, 1983, Tom Regan similarly protested against the assumption that people, he did not stipulate gender, who were concerned with animal welfare were irrational, sentimental, and emotional. He urged his fellow liberationists to make a concerted effort not 
to indulge our emotions or parade our sentiments, and that requires making a sustained commitment to rational inquiry. In this way, even the proponents of animals remained committed to a Cartesian distinction between reason and emotion, with the latter designated as somehow more feminine and weaker. Feminist um, environmentalist philosophers have developed what some call a care philosophy towards uh, non-human animals. Women's studies scholar Kathy Ruddy argues that rights are not the best way to talk about animals. Instead, we should be thinking about affect and advocacy. This would encourage a movement towards affective connections, or what she calls literally a change of heart. In environmental culture, Val Plumwood similarly calls for a dialogical interspecies uh, ethic. This too emphasizes the powers of nonverbal communication and involves reconstructing human identity in ways that acknowledge our anim animality and decenter rationality. Plumwood encourages humans to treat the other as a potentially intentional and communicative being and narrative subject as a way of moving from monological modes of encounter, such as those of anthropocentrism, to dialogical modes of encounter. Okay, just to conclude. We've seen, I think, some dramatic changes in the human responses to cruelty towards animals. Some are very predictable, such as the move from more theological um, to more secular rationales. Others increasingly extrapolate um, from human culture to animals. Anti-slavery and the human rights movements are two examples of that. More recently, more recently still, others have drawn inspiration from non-human animals, pointing out that they, too, have interests and preferences and ways of communicating. Now, understandably, there is a lot of emphasis in the animal ethics literature about not doing harm to animals. As sentient creatures, they have a right not to be hurt. But surely that is the most minimal, most minimal requirement, as even, in fact, Bentham recognized. In other words, animal rights that are rooted in an enlightenment rationality which privileges reason, rights theory, or calculative abstraction, utilitarianism, simply don't go far enough. Animals, like humans, are subjects of a life. They experience the world through encounters, collaborations, conflicts, and bonds of affection. The moral relevance of happiness and exuberance are relevant to them. Animals are feeling and acting social beings who also have a right, not simply not to be uh, inflicted with pain, but also have a right to enjoyment, pleasure, and, dare I say it, love. They are, in short, entitled to dance on our beds. Thank you very much.